It was the last quarter of the 19th century, and it was early June. An uncommonly warm, bright June, because at that time of year, it could sometimes be quite cold on Prince Edward Island, off the southeastern coast of Canada. The little girl on the ferry crossing from the mainland to the island was enjoying the sunshine. Her name was Anne. take her to the little station of Bright River, Matthew Cuthbert, wearing a white collar and his best suit, was on his way to the station to meet an orphan boy. Matthew knew he had to nod at the women he met on the road, something that he dreaded. He dreaded all women because he thought they laughed secretly at him. But on Prince Edward Island, you were supposed to nod at all and sundry, whether you knew them or not. Oh, it's so beautiful. Mm. Marilla Cuthbert was Matthew's sister. They were both unmarried and lived on their farm, Green Gables. The big rambling house surrounded by trees was barely visible from the main road. Matthew and Marilla had always been perfectly satisfied with their secluded life and never had any wish to move. Mrs. Rachel Lindy, their neighbour, just happened to glance out of a window when Matthew drove by. The sight of Matthew Cuthbert placidly driving away on a busy Wednesday afternoon, dressed in his best suit, puzzled at Mrs. Lindy. What's wrong, Marilla? I've just seen Matthew driving off. That's right, he's fetching an orphan boy for us. Hmm. I have to sit down, Marilla. Are you quite sure you're in earnest about the matter? What on earth could suddenly have put such a notion into your head? Suddenly? Matthew and I have been thinking about adopting an orphan boy for some time now, all winter, in fact. Ever since Mrs. Spencer said she was adopting a little girl. It's not too far now. We'll be home very soon. Why are the roads on the island so red, Mrs. Spencer? Well, how on earth should I know, Anne? But Marilla, 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 you and Matthew are far too old. That's exactly why we're adopting him. We're both getting on in years, Rachel. Matthew's 62 and he simply can't do all the chores on his own anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't have an heir to Green Gables either, so to whom will we leave all our worldly possessions? That's why we decided to adopt a smart, suitable boy of about 10 or 11. Ah, the train should be arriving at the station about now. <laughs> Right through the station. Will the train be stopping long? No, madam. It leaves directly for White Sands. Anne, please wait here on the platform. Someone will be here to fetch you soon. Yes, of course, Mrs. Spencer. Oh, oh. Goodbye, Andy. I do hope you'll be happy at Green Gables. Thank you, Mrs. Spencer. I'm sure I shall be. Give my regards to Miss Cuthbert. <laughs> Would you 
like to sit in the waiting room, little girl? No, thank you. Well, Marilla, I'll just tell you plain you're doing a mighty foolish thing. We'll just have to see whether we're doing a foolish thing or not, won't we, Rachel? Matthew and I have given a great deal of consideration to our decision, and I'm quite sure we'll be getting a decent, hard-working little boy from the orphanage. It's a risky thing you're doing. You can't be sure he will be a decent, hard-working little boy, Marilla. Just remember, you're bringing a strange child into your home. I heard of a case the other day where an orphanage child poisoned the well of the family who'd adopted him. The whole family became fearfully ill. Only in this instance, it wasn't a boy. It was a girl. Really? Well, that's all right, then. We're not getting a girl, so I'm sure there's no need to worry. A boy would never dream of doing such a thing. Well, I simply can't believe it. Marilla and Matthew. They don't know the first thing about bringing up children. I feel sorry for that poor little boy. Matthew's so shy, he only opens his mouth once a year and then one has to drag the words out of him. And the only thing Marilla's ever raised are day-old chicks. Will the 5.30 train from Charlottetown be long soon, George? Ah, there you are at last, Matthew. What happened? Has your watch stopped? The 5.30 train has been in and gone half an hour ago. People are always making fun of our train, but today it was exactly on time. Uh, but I... I... I will... No need to get agitated, Matthew. There was a passenger dropped off for you. She's sitting over there, waiting for you. I asked her to go into the ladies' waiting room, but she said she preferred to stay outside. There was more scope for imagination outside, that's what she said. More scope for the imagination. Have you ever heard anything like it? She's a real case, if you ask my opinion, Matthew. <laughs> but, but, uh, I, I'm not expecting a girl. Uh, I don't understand it. There must be some mistake. Who was Mrs. Spencer on the train? Yes, indeed she was. She got off the train with that girl. I don't understand it. I came for a boy, not a girl. Well, I'm sorry to say I can't help you there, Matthew. I think you should maybe question the girl. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they were clean out of boys with the brand you had in mind. 
Ask her. I dare say she'll be able to explain. Now I'm going home oh. for supper. Oh, no. Uh, please stay here. You can't leave me alone now. What am I going to tell Marilla? Oh. Hmm? I suppose you must be Mr. Matthew Cuthbert of Green Gables. Yes. I'm very glad to see you here, sir. Really very glad to see you, Mr. Cuthbert. Uh -huh. I was beginning to be afraid you weren't coming for me, and I was imagining all the things that might have happened to prevent you, and I have a vivid imagination. I'd made up my mind that if you didn't come, I'd go down the track to that big wild cherry tree, climb into it, and stay all night. Up there in the tree, I would also have been safe from the wolves. Wolves? What wolves? It would have been so very romantic to sleep in a wild cherry tree all laden with white blooms in the silvery moonlight, don't you think, Mr. Cuthbert? In the orphanage, we had only grey blankets. You can't really dream under a grey blanket, can you? admit you wake up in a much happier frame of mind in the morning when you've had a lovely dream during the night. Oh, I'm sorry I was late. Uh, come along, give me your bag. That's very kind of you, but I can manage. It really isn't very heavy, Mr. Cuthbert, although I have all my worldly goods in it. If it isn't carried in a certain way, the handle pulls out. <laughs> you see? So it's best if I keep it because I have the exact knack of it, Mr. Cuthbert. I'll be fine. Is this the way? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm very glad you turned up when you did, even if it would have been nice to sleep in a wild cherry tree. But that's something I can always do at a later stage. Not so, Mr. Cuthbert. We have to drive a long way, haven't we? Mrs. Spencer said it was a good eight miles to your home. I'm glad because I love driving, although I haven't often had the opportunity. Oh, it feels as if I'm dreaming. I'm no longer alone. I can't believe I'm going to live with you and belong to you forever. You and I are going to get along just fine. You'll see. At least I hope so. Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> How lovely. Comfy. They treated me very well at the orphanage, but unfortunately there is little scope for the imagination in an orphanage, and without that the soul dies. You are an orphan yourself, and all the other children are orphans too. Although I must say it was pretty interesting to imagine that perhaps the girl who sat next to you at the dinner table was really the daughter of a rich and famous earl who had been stolen away from her parents in her infancy by a cruel nurse who, needless to say, died before she could confess to a heinous crime. It was a fascinating story. You know, Mr. Cuthbert, I used to lie awake at night and imagine these things because I didn't have time in the day with all the work we had to do. I guess that's the reason why I'm so thin. I really am unattractively thin. There isn't a pick on my bones. You know what I like to imagine the most, Mr. Cuthbert, is that I'm the perfect shape, nice and plump with pretty chubby cheeks and dimples in my elbows. Mm. Do you think we could drive off now? That's what I've been waiting for. I promise you solemnly I won't fall off along the way, sir. <laughs> Giddy up! <gasps> Matthew was slowly recovering from the big surprise. Like most quiet folk, he liked talking to people when they were willing to do all the talking themselves and didn't expect him to keep up his end of the conversation. Anne sat next to him, telling him about the orphanage, her experiences and her dreams. And Matthew, much to his surprise, was enjoying himself. He'd never expected to enjoy the company of a little girl, but he quite liked the chatter of this freckled witch. On this island, so red, Mr. Cuthbert. Well, now I must confess that I've never given it any thought before now. Mr. Cuthbert, isn't it quite splendid to think of all the things there are that we can find out about? It wouldn't be half so interesting if we knew all about everything, would it? But how are you going to find out about things if you don't ask questions? Do I ask too many questions, Mr. Cuthbert? Would you rather that I didn't talk? If you say so, I'll stop immediately. 
I can't stop if I have to. I must simply make up my mind to it, that's all. Although I must say I find it difficult. But if you want me to, I will. Oh, no, you can talk as much as you like, my child. I don't mind. I like your chatter. Oh, really? I'm so glad. Thank you. I can hardly believe it. Everybody else I've ever known has always told me that children should be seen and not heard. I think I've had that said to me a million times, and people laugh at me because I use such big words. But if you have big ideas, you have to use big words to express them. Don't you agree with me, Mr Cuthbert? Well, now, I must say that does seem pretty reasonable. <laughs> Mrs. Spencer said that your place was called Green Gables, and she said there were trees all around the house. Oh, I do hope there are. I love trees. Where I come from, there's only one tree. A poor teeny weeny thing with a little whitewashed fence thing about it. It just looked like an orphan itself, that tree did. I wanted to cry when I looked at it. I always used to speak to that poor tree. I think it enjoyed it. I always used to say, oh, you poor thing, if you were out somewhere in a great big wood with other trees all around you and little mosses growing over your roots in a brook not far away, you could grow, couldn't you? But you can't where you are. I know exactly how you feel. I felt so sorry to leave that poor tree behind because nobody's going to talk to it now. Oh, I nearly forgot. May I please ask you something? Is there a brook anywhere near Green Gables? Yes, dear. There's one right below the house. <laughs> How exciting! It's always been one of my dreams to live near a brook, you know. What good fortune! I never expected the dream to really come true, sir. Dreams don't often come true, do they, Mr Cuthbert? I know I should actually be feeling perfectly happy and content today. But I must say... Well, I can't because, uh... Well... What colour would you call this hair, Mr Cuthbert? Mm. I'd say it's red, isn't it? Mm, yes, it's definitely red. Now can you understand why I can never be exactly perfectly happy, Mr Cuthbert? Nobody who was afflicted with red hair could ever be happy. I don't mind the other things so much, the freckles and the green eyes, or even my awful skinniness. I can imagine them away. I can even imagine that I have a beautiful rose petal complexion and lovely starry violet eyes. But this, this awful red hair. I can't wish this away, no matter how hard I try. I tell myself a thousand times my hair is black, as black as coal or as black and shiny as a raven's wing. But all the time I know my hair is just plain old red. And I can't help it, it breaks my heart. I'm sorry to say, but it will be my lifelong sorrow, Mr. Cuthbert. I read of a young girl once in a novel who had a lifelong sorrow, but her sorrow definitely wasn't caused by the unfortunate colour of her hair. That girl had hair of the purest gold, and she was divinely beautiful. Oh, Mr. Cuthbert! Oh, Mr. Cuthbert! Oh, sir!
I guess you're feeling tired. And pretty hungry as well. Why have you stopped talking, my child? Oh, tell me, Mr. Cuthbert. Do you remember that place we came through, that white place? Does it perhaps have a name? No, not that I know of. The people around here usually just call it the Avenue. It's a rather pretty place this time of the year. Pretty? Oh, pretty doesn't seem the right word to use at all, sir. And beautiful isn't at all appropriate either. Well, it was much, much more than beautiful. <laughs> it was truly remarkable. I could feel the ache of satisfaction right here. Do you ever feel that ache, sir? Hmm. Well, now, I just can't recollect that I ever have. I have it lots and lots of times. I have it whenever I see something that is royally beautiful. Oh, they shouldn't call that lovely place something mundane like Avenue. They should call it... Yes, that's it. Mr. Cuthbert, what do you think about, uh, the white way of delight? Perfect, isn't it? Oh, dear, I don't know. I'll have to give it some thought. Would you like me to tell you a little secret? When I don't like the name of a particular place or person, I always imagine a new one and always think of them so. Others may call it the Avenue. But for me, it will always be the white way of delight. Isn't it wonderful? Mm. Am I right? Are we very near Green Gables now? That's right. We only have about a mile to go, but how did you know? <sighs> I have no idea. I somehow just felt it, I guess. I'm very glad and at the same time very sorry, Mr. Cuthbert. I'm sorry because this drive has been so nice, and I'm always sorry when nice things come to an end. I wish it were possible for us to drive much further and see many more interesting things, but I'm glad to think of getting home. You see, I've never had a real home since I can remember. It gives me that pleasant ache again just to think of it. At long last, I'm coming to a real true home. And I only feel this funny ache deep down inside my heart when I know I'm the happiest person in the whole wide world. Matthew also had an ache in his heart, but not because he thought he was the happiest person in the world. He was thinking about what his sister Marilla would say, when instead of the expected orphan boy, he turned up with this red-haired freckled waif who never stopped talking. Matthew had become rather accustomed to the idea, but Marilla, how would Marilla react? Poor Matthew stirred uneasily, shrinking from the approaching revelation. It wasn't long before Anne and Matthew arrived at Green Gables. Anne was delighted with the house and could hardly wait to meet Marilla. But more about that first meeting next time.